All right, good morning. Sorry for the late start. Today's subject, as you can see, is uh, linear models again. And what we're going to talk about today is how to use linear models to learn nonlinear things. And there are two popular ways of doing that. Uh, and both built on the same principle, which we've seen before, which is that if you have a non-linearly separable, uh, if you have a data set that is not linearly separable, you can take the features that you have and add new features that are simply computations of the old features. And then if you fit a, a, <clears throat> a linear function to this new high dimensional data set, you can fit a non-linear function in the original space. So in the original two dimensional space, you get these non-linear decision boundaries. So that's very useful and something for you to try. And there are two, way, uh, two methods, two techniques that build on this, uh, this idea. The first is neural networks, where basically you take your linear uh, classifier or your linear regression problem and you put a layer under it, a layer of uh, what you can think of as feature extractors, which are learned. So you learn how to transform your data set to a higher dimensional space and then you uh, apply this linear method. So this is one form of a neural network, but this is one helpful way to think of a, a, a two-layer neural network. Uh, so we'll talk about that in the first half. And in the second half, we'll talk about support vector machines, which is our fine, uh, which also includes our final loss function. Uh, but support vector machines, as they are usually used, also a linear classifier or linear regression as well, um, they, uh, they don't have a learnable feature extractor, so this transformation to a higher dimensional space is not learned. But what you do is you use a kernel, which we'll go into in the second half, which is a very powerful way to very cheaply, without a lot of computation, expand your feature space massively. So you can, without much computation, using these kernel, features, uh, kernel functions, add loads and loads of features to your data set. <coughs> we'll look at that in the second half. So this is the plan. Uh, we'll start with neural networks. And uh, explain what the model is, what the model looks like. It's relatively simple. Uh, then we'll look at backpropagation, which is one ingredient, one method that we need in order to train these models that are slightly deeper and slightly more complex than um, the sort of one layer, one layer models we've seen so far, the linear models. Um, <clears throat> and that's all we'll say about neural networks today, but next week we'll continue when we talk about deep learning that's all based on the same stuff. Uh, and then we'll talk about support vector machines. Uh, which is just a way of doing a linear classifier, just like we've already seen, like logistic regression and least squares classifier. But it's one way that supports something called the kernel trick. which allows you to uh, use this, uh, apply these kernel functions that I talked about earlier. Uh, today's <clears throat> lecture is a bit of a history lesson in the sense that from the years I've indicated here, so from 1985 to 1995 roughly, neural networks were the most popular way of doing machine learning. And you saw systems like this Alvin self-driving car that we saw in the first lecture. Uh, they were very popular. And then after about 1995, they went out of fashion. We'll have a look at why that might have been. And then uh, support vector machines came in and they were very popular. And then around 2005, uh, support vector machines sort of went out of fashion and neural networks came back in a big way. And we'll have a look at what the reasons for that might be. But first, let's start here. 
this is a neuron, a picture of a neuron, a brain cell. And it basically uh, got some inputs, some, uh, let me say it properly, it receives different input signals through um, connections called dendrites. So it's got many different inputs. Those are called dendrites. It generates one output, which it sends out through an axon. <clears throat> and the axon splits and sends that same signal to lots of different cells. That's how, how your brain works. Uh, so in the early, uh, uh, well, even before the 60s, in the uh, late 50s, <clears throat> Uh, people were thinking about machine learning and thinking, well, we've got one thing that learns, that's the brain. Maybe we can take how the brain works, massively simplify it, and see if we can build that into a computer. And when I say massively simplify, I mean massively simplify, because computers especially then were very slow, so you couldn't really simulate everything a neuron does. Uh, so they approximated it with a very, very simple linear function, which I should mention doesn't have that much to do with what a neuron actually does. Uh, but it was a sort of starting point. And that looks like this. So we have a, an output Y and multiple inputs, X1 and X2. Uh, we multiply each of the inputs with a weight, which is the thing that we're training to train the model. And we also have one input, which is called the bias node, which is always one. Uh, and we multiply that with a special weight called B. So it looks like this, W1 times X1. Uh, we, yeah, so we multiply each input times its weight, and we sum them all up. So that looks like this, that's the output. And then, for instance, if we're doing a, a gender classification, like we saw in this, uh, this video we saw in the First lecture, that was actually a perceptron, literally. It was a video of the perceptron in action, um, which is the name for this, uh, this one, one neuron neural network. Um, and then if the output is larger than zero, we call it uh, a man and otherwise a woman, and then somehow we have to figure out how to fit these weights to a data set. So hopefully you can see that this is basically just a linear classifier. It's a fancy name, they call it a perceptron, but basically this is just a linear classifier. Uh, and this here is the dot product, and then there's a bias term, and that's all it is. But what we want to do, what makes the brain powerful, is not that it has a single neuron, but that it has a bunch of neurons that are wired together. So that's what we want to do with perceptrons as well. And then we run into a problem. So if we take a bunch of perceptrons, three perceptrons here, uh, and we take the output of the first two perceptrons, and we stick it into the third perceptron, <coughs> then we build a little network of perceptrons. Uh, it turns out that the uh, function computed by this network, you can see it below here, you can just work that out, this is the function it computes. If you work out all the brackets, it looks like this, because it's one linear function input to another linear function, so you can just work out all the brackets and you get one big linear function. So the whole thing collapses to just doing exactly the same as one single, slightly bigger perceptron. So by stacking these neurons, you don't actually get any extra complexity. The function stays linear. You don't learn any nonlinearity, which is what we want. In order to fix this, we need to insert a little bit of nonlinearity to stop this sort of collapsing happening. And there are two, uh, we'll look at the two most popular nonlinear functions and then see how they're applied. So these nonlinearities, they are scalar functions. One number goes in, one number comes out. Uh, for a long time, the most popular one was the sigmoid, which we've already seen in the context of logistic regression. Uh, it looks like this, it takes the output from, uh, sorry, it takes the domain from minus infinity to positive infinity and squishes it into the range between zero and one. And the way you would apply that, which I've denoted like this, like a little circle with an S inside it, is you compute this sum, you compute this product, uh, the, the sum of the products, and then you apply the uh, sigmoid. So it's basically, one perceptron does the same thing as one logistic regression uh, classifier, 
and then we chain these perceptrons together. So there's a little bit of nonlinearity, but mostly it's, it's uh, linear, but this little bit of nonlinearity helps us, uh, stops the whole thing from collapsing. Uh, and then in later years, <coughs> Uh, a function uh, nonlinearity that became a bit more popular because it's sort of more numerically stable. We'll look at that a little bit more next week. Was the ReLU unit, the um, rectified linear unit, which basically is almost an identity function. It's very, uh, in, in the, so if, if the input is positive, it's just a linear identity function. But if the input is negative, it gets clipped to zero. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so the question is, is one of the reasons that the ReLU is more popular that it's less computationally expensive? Well, it certainly is. Uh, but generally, if you train a big neural network, the activations are not the bottleneck for the computation. Um, so it's more to do with the gradient of the function. But uh, we don't really have the tools to explain that now. We'll explain that in the uh, next week's lecture. But it is also, yeah, it is computationally more expensive, uh, more, uh, less expensive. Anyway, so now we can build up a neural network. And the way that's normally done is uh, in a structure called a feed-forward ne network, where you stack your neurons, your nodes, build them together in layers. And nodes in a layer are not connected to each other. Only, uh, they only take input from the previous layer, and they only send their output to the next layer. That's just a simple, uh, efficient way of, of uh, building a neural network. And usually you only do two layers, certainly in this sort of uh, pre-95 regime where we're talking about two layers was all we could do, both for computational reasons and because it, if we added more layers, it would just wouldn't learn anymore. So most of the neural networks in those days look like this. We had, some, we had an input layer where the input nodes are. Then we had a hidden layer where the hidden nodes are call hidden because we don't, uh, well, because they're not, uh, we don't look at them uh, normally. And then we have an output layer which takes their input from the hidden layer. It's also called a multi-layer perceptron or MLP, which is a common abbreviation used for these sort of things. And it's just the name for the basic neural network. And if the output layer, as I've drawn it here, is, um, Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, just a, a naming convention for the weights. Uh, so we'll hold to this convention for this lecture. We'll say uh, weights in the first layer we'll call W, and we'll index them by first the node they come from, and then the node they go to. So the weight from node, input node X1 to hidden node H2 is W12. And then if we have one output node, we don't need to index for the output node, so we just use... Uh, a single index for the V uh, weights. So now we can do machine learning with this. So we can do regression and classification. We'll start with basic regression, which is very simple now. It's just we make sure that our output node should have any possible value between minus infinity and positive infinity. So that doesn't have an activation. So this top part is just a linear function, a linear regression function, which we've seen already many, many times before. And then below it, its inputs uh, is a what we'll call a feature extraction layer, which looks like this. So this thing, we just have a normal linear uh, regression function here, but its inputs are computed by another neural network layer. And then we'll see in a bit how we train the whole thing in one go. But as a regression uh, model, this is fairly straightforward. Uh, if we want to do classification, the simplest way to do that is to make the top part a uh, logistic regression, which just means sticking a sigmoid activation on top of it. So now the output is a value between 0 and 1, which we can interpret as the probability of one class. 
the probability of the positive class, as we saw in the last lecture. And again, we'll see later how to train this. Uh, and one thing we haven't seen before is what to do if we have multiple classes. So for instance, in this digit classification, we have 10 different classes, then this won't suffice. This, this only works for two classes, for, uh, yeah, for two classes, because we know the probability of the positive class, and one minus that is the probability of the negative class. So for a binary classification, one node is enough. Uh, but if we have multiple classes, then we prefer to use one node for each class. Uh, so if this were the digit classification, there would be 10 output nodes. And the activation we apply then is called a softmax activation, which basically ensures that these output values uh, all sum to one, that they're all positive and that they all sum to one. And the way we do that, because before the activation, the values are between minus infinity and positive infinity. So the way we do that is we, yeah, so that would look like this. The way we do that is we take the raw uh, outputs, which are minus infinity, po uh, pos uh, positive infinity. We take their exponential, which makes them positive, because the exponential function, where's my marker? The exponential function looks like this. So it takes this range of input values and maps it to anything above the zero. And then we can just normalize. So long as they're all positive, we can just sum them all up and divide i by the sum of uh, all those values. And then the result after that softmax activation is uh, a bunch of values that we can interpret as class probabilities, which we can then fit. So that's how to do regression, class, binary classification, and multi-class classification with a neural network. So then we have to figure out how to train this. Uh, first thing is uh, we have to define a loss function. Well, we've already seen all the loss functions we might want to use, so for regression you would simply use the least squares loss. For Binary classification, you would use the uh, log loss that we've already seen, which is also called the cross-entropy loss. And for multi-class classification, it works the same thing. So you know the true class, you just take the logarithm of the probability of the true class, and that's your, uh, uh, take the negative of that, and that's your loss. Rather, that's the value you want to maximize. So you take the probability of the true class, and that's the value you want to maximize. Same as with the logistic regression. So then you have a loss function. And then we can do basically just do gradient descent, uh, except that with neural networks, it starts to get a little bit uh, expensive to compute the value of the gradient, to compute the gradient over the whole data set. Uh, it's possible, but it takes a full pass over the data set and it doesn't, you need a lot of steps, so that's expensive. So what we do instead is stochastic gradient descent uh, which is essentially we pretend to sample one instance from the data distribution, compute the gradient, compute the loss only for that instance, compute the gradient over that loss, and then take a small step in that direction. And then we sample another uh, instance from the data distribution, and so on and so on. Practically, when I say sampling from the data distribution, it just means picking an instance from the data, from the data set because the data set is a bunch of samples from our data distribution. So we just loop over the data set. We don't sample randomly usually. We just loop, that's fine. Uh, and then for each instance, that's a crucial thing. For each instance, we compute the loss separately, just for that instance, and then we uh, loop. So the gradient sort of jumps around a lot, because for one instance, the gradient points that way, for another, the gradient points that way. But on average, the gradient averages out to the right value, which is gradient over the whole data set. And because we only take small steps, we set eta quite low, uh, it still works very well. So this is stochastic gradient descent, and that's usually how neural networks are trained. So the basics of training neural networks, we get, get some examples of inputs and outputs. That's just classification, then the outputs are classes. If it's regression, then the outputs are numbers. Uh, 
We figure out loss functions, so least squares cross entropy. We work out the gradient of the loss with respect to the weights. And then we use stochastic gradients then to improve the weights bit by bit. So it's a lot like what we've seen already. Uh, and you can oh, do this in your, where's my cursor? Oh, sorry. Oh, there it is. You can do this in your browser on this uh, playground or TensorFlow. So now we've seen that it uh, looks a lot like what we, have, what we had before, but a hidden layer has been added, which is a little wider than the input. Usually you want more hidden units than input units. Uh, we have a sigmoid activation. We have a classification, so we have this Tor classification thing, which we know cannot be uh, solved linearly from just two uh, input features. We've turned off all the extra features because now the neural network is going to learn our extra features. Uh, and we've set the learning rate to 0 0.3. So let's see how it does. Well, struggling a little bit so far, but it should at some point work out. Yeah, now it's starting to work out how these middle, how to cover these middle, uh, middle uh, data points. So it's slowly converging. You can see here the uh, loss at the top right, the training loss plotted together with the test loss which tells you whether or not you're overfitting, or the validation loss. So you can check if your training loss gets much lower than your validation loss, then you're fitting the training set very well, but not the validation, so then you're overfitting. Uh, so it's sort of doing all right. It's got some weird point here in the bottom left, which is not being corrected because there's no data there. But by and large, it's sort of making the, the shape we're, think we're looking for. Uh, we can change the activation to the sigmoid, sorry, to the ReLU and see how it's doing then. And that should actually be much better and much quicker. Uh, what you see is that a sigmoid activation leads to sort of curvy uh, decision boundaries, whereas a ReLU activation leads to piecewise linear decision boundaries. Uh, so it's mostly linear, mostly uh, lines, but they're sort of, uh, angular, which allows us to learn this Tor function much better. And you can sort of see already here why the ReLU function is a bit more popular. Uh, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, so uh, the question is, do you define uh, which input features are linked to which feature, uh, which part of which nodes in the hidden layer? Um, in the feed-forward network, everything is fully connected. So from one layer to the next, it's always fully connected. That's sort of the defining property. Um, in some cases, domain knowledge allows you to say these should be connected, these should not be connected. Um, we'll look at an example of that next week called the convolutional neural network. But for the feed-forward network, it's basically saying, I don't know how they should be connected, so I connect everything, and I'll let the neural network learn if they shouldn't be connected, then they should go to zero, which incidentally you can see here. So from X1 to H4, the first input feature to the uh, fourth hidden feature, you see that the weight has become almost zero. Uh, I think I can even highlight that. There, you see that the weight is 0 0.07. So there the neural network has basically learned that that, way, that connection should be there. So I recommend playing around with that. Uh, but for now, there's one unanswered question, which is how do we work out this gradient? Because these neural networks are going to get, this is already uh, maybe pretty complex, but they are going to get a lot more complex. Um, we are going to eventually go to neural networks with billions of uh, weights uh, and, and up to hundreds of layers, 
So the question is, how do you compute the gradient for that? Because this, what we've done so far, just on p, uh, pen and paper working out the gradient, then no longer works. Uh, so there's three basic options for working out gradients. What we've done so far is what we call symbolically. So you get some pen and paper, and you apply what you learned in high school until you uh, get rid of all the difference, uh, differentiation symbols. And then you have a function, and then you write that function into the computer. If that gets too complex, you can actually, you can make the computer do this. So most of you will have used Wolfram Alpha at some point. That's basically a symbolic differentiation engine. Uh, so it is possible there are good algorithms for it, but it gets very expensive. As the function grows, the time required to symbolically compute the, different, uh, the, the gradient uh, grows exponentially with it. So that stops working, except for very uh, simple functions. We can also do numeric integration, which is basically what you've uh, probably done in high school to see how the uh, gradient is defined, where basically you take two points very near each other, you compute the value of the uh, function and you fit a line through it or a plane and you look at the slope of that plane. And if your original points are close enough to each other, that works, that's called, the, um, uh, that's called numeric uh, differentiation. And you can do that in different ways uh, as well by sampling random points, uh, which works reasonably well, but it's also expensive. The bigger your space, the more dimensions you have, the more expensive it gets, and it's quite unstable. So you're not sure that you're getting an exact answer. Uh, so that's all. We also rule that one out as well, and we look for some middle ground, which is called backpropagation. So backpropagation is not quite symbolic, not quite fully symbolic, and not quite fully numeric. And it works like this. We describe our model as a composition of modules. And then the gradient is the product of the gradient of each module with respect to each other, its arguments. So the first thing we do is we describe our function that we're interested in as a chain of modules where the uh, output of one module goes into the input of the next module. And then basically we apply the chain, the chain rule which I've been telling you is very important. This is why it's so important. So three steps. You break your computation down in a chain of modules. It's up to you how you do that. We'll look at some examples. You work out the derivative of each module with respect to its input symbolically. So that's the pen and paper thing. Uh, we call that the local gradient, or the local derivative. And then you uh, work out the global gradient in terms of these local derivatives by applying the chain rule. And from that point on, you do uh, things numerically. From that point on, it becomes a numerical computation. That's easy to see with an example. So we'll look at a, a simple example, not a neural network, just some function for which you might want to know the uh, derivative. It doesn't have weight, so we'll just take the derivative with respect to the argument for now with respect to x, uh, and we'll see how this backpropagation works. So you might, this is actually a function where you might, if you're good at it, work out the derivative yourself, uh, but we'll save ourselves the trouble. So the first step is to take this function and rewrite it as a step of functions uh, that are all chained together, composed together. So what happens here is first we start with x, we take the negative of x, we call that function a, which is returns the negative of its argument. That function goes into an exponent function, which we'll call b. So b takes the exponent of a. <coughs> uh, then there's a sign that the result of that goes into a sine function. And then the result of that we take two over the uh, uh, we take two divided by that, two divided by c. And if we chain all these modules together in order then we get f again. It's pretty straightforward, right? So it's a chain of modules, which we can write as what we call a computation graph. So here, every intermediate value is a dot in the computation graph, and the arrows between them represent the modules. Uh, 
So now we can apply the chain rule. Now we can do the whole thing with just the chain rule. So here we see that the derivative of f over x is the derivative of this big chain of modules composed together. Over its in so uh, applying the first chain rule, uh, the derivative of d over its argument, uh, so the derivative of f over x is the derivative of the first module over its argument times its argument over x. So it's the first application of the chain rule. Uh, and because these brackets are a bit noisy and difficult to parse, we'll throw them away and we'll just say d uh, to represent d with its argument. And we always know what the argument of d is, so we can uh, throw that away and just say f over x is d over c times c over x. And then we can unpack c over x, which is c over its argument, which is b, so c over x becomes c over b times b over a. Oh, sorry, c over x becomes c over b times b over x, and then we unpack b over x, which comes b over a times a over x. So you just apply the chain rule over and over and over again, and the uh, derivative that we're interested in becomes just this long product of local derivatives. Uh, so here we see that chain rule version of the derivatives, the computation graph. And we call this, so we call this a global derivative, the one that we're interested in. And all of these factors in the product we call the local derivatives. That's just my name for it, but we need a name for it. So here again is a backpropagation algorithm. We write our function as a composition of modules, which is this A, B, C, D. We work out the local derivative of each module symbolically. We do a forward pass for a given input x, so we pass it through these, this chain of modules. And we remember all the intermediate values. We remember the values of A, B, C, and D. And then we compute the local derivative for x using these intermediate values and multiply them to get the derivative of f over x. So here we see the local derivatives filled in. So these local derivatives, we work them out. They're pretty straightforward. We start at, if we start at the back, uh, the derivative of a with respect to x is minus 1. The derivative of b with respect to a, not with respect to x, but with respect to a, is just e to the power of a, because it's the exponent function, so it doesn't change when we take the derivative. Uh, the derivative of the sine function is the cosine, and then the derivative of 2 over c is a bit more complicated, but it becomes minus 2 over c to the power of 2. And we multiply all these together, we get f over x, but notice that we don't do two things. We don't fill in the values of C, B, and A. We could do that and work it all out and get a full symbolic representation of the derivative, but that would be too complex. So we leave it as is. And then we fill in the numeric values of these intermediate values, B, C, and A, and we just compute this value numerically. So let's look at an example for some input which looks random, minus 4.499. We'll see why later why. It will become clear why I picked that value. So step one is we do a forward computation. So we feed it to f, feed it through this chain, and we remember all the intermediate values, which are these. So we get the output value, which is 2. Great. And then we... Uh, take these intermediate values and we fill them into these local derivatives. So C becomes 2, B becomes 90, A becomes 4.499. And this we work out numerically. So we just work this out numerically and we come to 0. So that's backpropagation. It gives us a middle ground between symbolic differentiation and numeric differentiation. Let's look at how that looks in a neural network. So this is our neural network, our uh, feedforward network. We'll use a simple uh, 
uh, linear output, so no uh, activation function on the output, sigmoid activations on the hidden uh, layer, and we'll look at the parameters V2 and W12 and see what the gradients are for those parameters. Because if we know those gradients, then we can apply gradient descent. So we're looking for the uh, derivative of the loss, remember. We're not interested of the, in the derivative of the output, we're interested in the derivative of the loss. So on top of this neural network, we also compute the loss with respect to the parameters V2 and W12. This is our loss function, just the squared error. <coughs> Uh, there's no sum because we're doing stochastic gradient descent, so we're only looking at the loss for one example. So the loss is y, uh, the output of the neural network y minus the example output from the data t, the target output. <coughs> uh, we subtract them and take the square. Then y is the result of this function, as we've seen. <coughs> That's just the output of the second layer. Uh, H is the result of this sigmoid function, so H prime is the raw linear output which we pass through a sigmoid function to get H2. And then H2 uh, prime is just again this linear function over the inputs. So those are our modules of our neural network. <coughs> uh, so let's look at the derivative over V2. We don't need all the modules for that, so we can forget uh, about the first layer. Uh, so this is, well, we apply the chain rule once. So the loss over V2 is a loss over Y times a, uh, Y over V2. <coughs> and that's, uh, we only need to apply the chain rule once and we're there. Because we're only interested in this uh, parameter which is very close to the loss. Uh, local derivatives are very easy, so um, the derivative of the loss is just taking the, um, sort of applying the chain rule there as well, but internally. Uh, so the exponent to the power of 2 goes out in front, and uh, the rest cancels out. <coughs> uh, and then the derivative of y over h2, that's just a linear function, so all these terms cancel out, and we just end up with h2. So this is our gradient, very straightforward. So now if we apply gradient descent purely on this uh, V2 parameter, it looks like this. This is our update rule for the gradient descent. Uh, so to see what that means, to give you some intuition for, for how to interpret this and how, how this error back propagates through the neural network. <coughs> Sorry, here's an uh, analogy. Imagine there's a government with a prime minister on top, a middle layer of uh, ministers, uh, and below that civil servants. So the prime minister listens to his ministers when he has to make a decision, and the ministers each listen to all of the civil servants when they have to make a decision. And for each minister, the prime minister has a level of trust, the extent to which they trust that minister how much they listen to them. And that can even be negative. So then if the level of trust is negative and the minister says you should definitely do this, the prime minister will be less likely to do it. And the same goes for the civil servants. So then we compute the forward pass. So the prime minister has to make a decision like what tax to set on cigarettes, gets advice from all his ministers, he weighs it by its level of trust and sums it up. And he uh, makes a decision. And the decision goes well or it backfires, so he gets some error. He gets some indication of the consequence of his decision. And based on that, he's going to look at the levels of trust and he's going to adjust them. So basically what he wants is that if, he advise, if somebody advised him to do the thing he did and it backfired, then he needs to reduce the level of trust. If somebody advised him against it, and it backfired, he needs to increase the level, level of trust, and uh, vice versa if it's uh, the other way around, if it went well. So if we look at H2, how should the Prime Minister update his level of trust in H2? Basically, he looks at how well the thing went, 
Uh, so Y is what he said as the tax on cigarettes, and T is what he should have said as the tax on cigarettes. Uh, and he multiplies that by what H2 told him to do. So if the error is positive, that means basically he set Y too high. And in that case, if H2 told him to do what he did, he will lower his trust in him. Uh, and if the error is negative, that means he set Y too low. And if H2 told him to do what he did, he will increase his trust in her. So what you see here especially is the importance of the signs. Uh, because this square disappeared from the error, we preserve the sign of the error, whether Y is higher or lower than T. And that gets multiplied, this positive or negative gets multiplied by the positive or negative of H in exactly the way we expect. So if we want to go one layer, oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, so how do you know the value of T? Uh, in our neural network, T comes from the data set. They are given examples. In this analogy, you will have to figure out, yeah, uh, we'll assume that it's word of God or something. Uh, basically, that's where the analogy breaks down. Uh, so if we want to go to lower, we have to backpropagate through this activation function. So we need to know the derivative of the, um, <coughs> the sigmoid, which looks like this. So remember, if you take one minus, so sigmoid is the orange line, if you take one minus sigmoid, it flips around horizontally. And if you multiply these two, you get the derivative. You can work that out if you have time, we won't go into it today. But that's the derivative, it's just sigmoid times one, uh, one minus sigmoid. So now we can work out the derivative over W12. So we need all the modules. They're here above the line. And we work them out all the with the chain rule. So L over Y times Y over H2, Y over H2 prime to get through the activation function, and then H2 prime over W12 to get to this W12 parameter that we're actually interested in. So we can work out the local derivatives. The first is easy, we've seen it already, it's just as y, uh, 2 times y2, uh, yt, sorry. Uh, h over y, sorry, y over h is over here, it's just that term again, so in this case v2 falls out, because now we're taking the derivative with respect to h2. Uh, then h2 over h2 prime, that's the derivative of the sigmoid because from h2 prime to h2 is a sigmoid function. So that's just h2 times 1 minus h2. And then for the last one, h2 prime over w12 uh, is just a linear function again. So the only term that remains is the x1 term, and the w1 cancel, w12 cancels out. So we end up with this long thing as a derivative, uh, as an update rule for our gradient descent. So what we see is basically what H2 does to update her level of trust in civil servant X1. She looks first at the global error. Then she looks at what did I contribute to the global error? Was that positive or negative? Then she works in uh, the effect of this uh, activation rule because how much she needs to adjust the level of trust depends on where she is in this regime of the sigmoid function. So if she's all, all the way out here, uh, then even if she takes a relatively large step, it doesn't, use, uh, it doesn't change things that much, so she needs to take that into account. So that's done by multiplying by the derivative of the activation function. And then she looks at x1's contribution specifically to see whether x1 told her to do what she did or told her to do the opposite, and by how much x1 told her to do that. And you multiply all those together and all the signs work out in the correct way, and you get a correct update for your level of trust in x1. So, neural networks. Networks of artificial neurons or perceptrons 
uh, simplest version that we look at today is a feedforward network. We'll look at more complicated versions later. <coughs> uh, trained by stochastic gradient descent, so one example at a time. And we don't work out the entire gradient anymore. We use the backpropagation algorithm to find a middle ground between symbolic working out of the gradient and numeric working out of the gradient. That's how neural networks work. And they were very popular for a long time. And then not so much anymore for a few reasons. Um, they're very non-convex. So there's no global guaranteed global optimum. Or, well, there is a global optimum. There's no way to find to guarantee that you found it. Um, back then, the single forward backward was very expensive. Uh, and uh, yeah, we didn't have good ways to abstract. There was a, there were a lot of possibilities for how to wire your neural network, a lot of hyperparameters, and we lacked good abstractions and good libraries and good, uh, uh, good ways of thinking about this. So it was all basically a little bit too difficult. Uh, and a lot of that, as we'll see after the break, was solved by support vector machines. Uh, next week, we'll continue on neural networks. And we'll see what we haven't, we'll take the perspective that we haven't taken now, is that all of this is just computable by linear algebra. So if you look at this, First layer, it's just a matrix multiplication. The addition of this bias node is just the addition of a vector. And we do a uh, single element-wise nonlinear function. And then the second layer is just a dot product, which gives us y. So the whole operation of the neural network can just be written like this, which is very helpful when we want to make things more complex. Um, <clears throat> so don't get too hung up on this analogy with the brain. We call them neural networks, but basically it's just a stack of linear algebra operations with a little bit of nonlinearity in between. So let's take a break there and uh, see if we can manage to do support vector machines in the time that remains. All right, let's get started again. Find your seat. Um, so the second part of this lecture is about support, fec support vector machines, <clears throat> which, as I said, is sort of the period, be uh, the popular, most popular method in the period between 1995 and 2005. Um, they are not as popular anymore, but they are still used in some corners, and they still have their uses. So it's important to know about them but relatively speaking, it's a bit of a dead end. There's not a lot of research about them anymore. So that's, uh, it's good to know how they work. But compared to neural networks, at the moment at least, uh, neural networks, we're going to build on them a lot more and support vector machines, we will explain and leave it there. Um, and support vector machines are basically, uh, the main ingredient there is, will be our uh, third loss function. So we saw the least squares loss, we saw the logistic regression, the log loss, and now we will see the SVM loss. Uh, so a little reminder, this is how we draw the linear classifier. So we define the linear classifier by choosing a function that extends out of the, uh, a linear function that extends out of the feature space. Uh, and if that linear function is higher than zero, we call it one class. If it's lower than zero, we call it the other class. Which means that the point where it crosses the feature space is our decision boundary. So if you have two features, it looks like this. We have our linear function, our, which in this case describes a hyperplane. Uh, and the plane here of x1 and x2, those, that's our feature space. And our hyperplane sort of crosses that plane and the point where it crosses is the decision boundary. Uh, so one thing to note, which is important for this lecture, is that there are infinitely many different hyperplanes that define this decision boundary. If this is the decision boundary we want to define, any hyperplane that crosses this line, we sort of rotate this one to any angle, uh, they all define the same decision boundary. So we have sort of one extra degree of freedom, and we're going to use that. <coughs> 
And what we saw with the logistic regression was that it worked very well, and it's a very good method. But if our classes are very linearly separable, then we have the problem that logistic regression makes a sort of arbitrary choice of which plane to choose to separate them, which, uh, sorry, which decision boundary to choose to separate them. Uh, and in order to uh, solve that, we can use the following principle. Here's a, a very uh, simple data set with a very poor classifier that classifies them both, that uh, sorry, uh, separates both the classes. And what we see here is that if we were to draw a, another point that is a lot like this uh, red point on the right, but very slightly noisy, so if we take this red point on the right and we shift it a tiny little bit, then it becomes classified as a blue point, then it switches to the other side of the decision boundary, which is why this is a bad choice for a classifier even though it separates the two classes perfectly. We don't want it because the red points are so close to the decision boundary, the area where we know that the class is red is so close to the decision boundary that just adding a tiny little bit of noise will push it to the wrong class. In other words, what we want is we want all the points to be as far away from the decision boundary as possible. And on the right side of the decision boundary, obviously. So that would look like roughly like this. So this is the line for which the distance to all the points, uh, the line that linearly separates both the classes, and for which the distance to all the points is maximal. And that distance we call the margin. We'll call it M in this case. And we want the line where the margin is the biggest. So here, uh, here the margin is zero more or less, and here the margin is maximum. So that's how we're going to choose between, if we have multiple options for this uh, classifier, that's how we're going to choose between the multiple options. Uh, so good question, is it between the two closest points or the average of all the points? This is just the closest points. So the trick here is that if you change the line, which are the, then it may change which the closest points are, right? Uh, so we're sort of optimizing in two different ways. We're looking at which are the closest points and then optimizing the distance to those. Uh, so we'll see how to do that. It turns out there's a neat, uh, neat formal way to do that. Um, but for now, we'll stick with just for a given line. This is the margin. And the closest points, we will call the support vectors. Uh, because they're vectors, they're points in space, so we can call them vectors and they support the hyperplane, which is to say, if I gave you just the support vectors and I throw away the rest of the data, you can still work out what the line should be from just the support vectors. So in that sense, the support vectors support the decision boundary. Um, so like I said earlier, for this particular decision boundary, there's infinitely many hyperplanes that define it. Right, because there's how uh, the hyperplane just has to cross the feature plane through this decision boundary. But if we just rotate it a little bit, we can change it without changing the decision boundary. So there's infinitely many hyperplanes that define this decision boundary. So in order to help us define this margin, what we'll do is we will define uh, not just that the plane is zero at the decision boundary, but also that it is minus one at the red, at the negative support vectors, and plus one at the positive support vectors. So out of all these infinitely many hyperplanes, we just pick one by saying it's minus one here and it's plus one here. So if we look at it from the side, that looks like this. Here we have the data set. We choose our support vectors, which are the open points. And then we want the line that makes the blue support vector, gives the blue support vector value one, and gives the red support vector value minus one, which looks like this. And it tells us also that all the, uh, yeah, so not these lines, we have infinitely many, sorry. We have infinitely many lines from which we can choose, but we choose the one that gives us one for the, blue support vector minus one for the red support vector. Uh, 
It also means that all the other points that are not support vectors, uh, if they're blue, they will have a value higher than one. The line will give them a value higher than one. And if they're red, the line will give them a value lower than minus one. That's important because we can now start to define our objective, or the thing we want to minimize, or maximize in this case. So we want to maximize this margin because we want the distance to the support vectors to be as big as possible. So we want to somehow maximize uh, this value that is both of these margins. So the margin is the same on each side, so just twice the size of the margin. That's the value we want to maximize. We'll look at how to formalize that later. But we want to do it under these constraints. That if the point is positive, if the point is in the class, uh, set of positive points, uh, the line that we choose, WTX plus B, should evaluate to one if it's a support vector or bigger than one if it's not a support vector. So it should evaluate to uh, one or bigger than one. And if it's in the negative class, this line should evaluate to minus one or smaller. So if we maximize this value under these constraints, we get the maximum margin hyperplane. So in other words, or in the same words, we want to maximize this value, keep these guys above one, and keep these guys below minus one. So we need to simplify this a little bit so that we can work with it. Uh, we'll look, uh, start with the constraints first. We can turn these two constraints into one constraint by assigning, uh, by inventing a value y, which is the same value we used actually in the least squares classifier, which is just a value uh, for each point. If it's a positive point, y is one. If it's a negative point, y is minus one, which is just a little helper column we can add to our data set. Uh, and if we do that, we can simplify our constraint. Because if we then multiply y by the output, that value should always be bigger than one. Because if it's a positive point, then y is just one, so it's just the same constraint as we saw here. And if it's a negative point, uh, then we multiply the whole thing by minus one, and uh, we uh, find the same constraint. So basically, this is just a way y, this in y that we introduce that indicates a class with a plus or minus one is just a way of simplifying these two constraints into one constraint, which is nice. Simplifies things. But now we need to deal with a bigger problem, which is uh, what's the size of the margin? Given some w, what is this value here? Because we need to express this in mathematics so we can actually properly optimize it. So let's look at the picture first. This is our uh, picture again. So these are the decisions we made. We had a, a decision boundary defined by some value w and some value uh, b. We call this the margins, the distance to the neck, to the uh, support vectors. Uh, and the length of both the margins put together is 2m. It's the size of one margin we call m. And as we saw before, we decided to put the margins at the point where the, uh, the line, the, the, the hyperplane, evaluates to minus 1 and it evaluates to 1. Um, so now we want to work out what this, what this is. What's the size of this 2m? Uh, a couple of things to make our life easier. Firstly, we can change b freely. If we change b around, it doesn't really matter. It won't affect the size of the margin, because this hyperplane just goes up or down, but the margins stay the same. So we can change b to whatever value we need. We don't need to work it out, but we just assume that we've changed b so that the lower margin hits the origin. So just translate the whole hyperplane down a little bit or up a little bit until the lower margin hits the origin, because that will help us in our working out. And another thing we can do is we can remember that w is a vector, and it points perpendicular to the decision boundary. Because the decision boundary, uh, because w is the direction in which the hyperplane increases the quickest, right? That's because it's a gradient. Uh, and the decision boundary is the direction in which the hyperplane doesn't increase at all, or doesn't change at all, because it say, keeps the same value, it stays zero. So these two are perpendicular to each other. Uh, and that helps us, because basically what we're trying to work out now is the norm, the length of the vector A, 
call this point A, where we want to figure out what the length of this line is, and we know that that line points in the same direction as W, which we will use. So 2M, the value we're interested in, is just the norm of this point, which we'll call A. And now we can work it out pretty easily, because uh, we know that at the origin, because, of, because that's where we put the hyperplane, at the origin, the value W Tx plus B evaluates to minus 1, because we put the origin on the lower margin. So we have this. We know that at point A, which is in the high upper margin, the value evaluates to 1. So we know these two things. We can sum them together, sum the left-hand side of both uh, to the, or subtract them, sorry, take the left-hand side of both and subtract, sorry, take the left-hand side of this, subtract the left-hand side of this, take the left-hand side of this, subtract the left-hand side of this. Uh, then the b's cancel out. The dot product with 0 is just 0, because you multiply by 0 a bunch of times and add it up. So what you end up with is WTA is 2. Now we know from the geometric definition of the dot product that if the vectors point in the same direction, which they do, uh, that the cosine of A becomes 1, the cosine of the angle between them is 1. So the dot product is just the uh, norm of one vector times the norm of the other vector. So that's what we get here. If we get, take the norm of W and multiply it by the norm of A, we get 2. And then we can just rearrange to give us the value of A. So the magnitude of A, which is, remember, expressed the value that we're in, interested in, is 2m, is just 2 divided by the norm of W. So after all that, what we get is this. This is now our optimization objective. We want to maximize 2, w, 2 over W, 2 over the norm of W, which we've just proved expresses the size of these two margins added together under the condition that these constraints hold. Uh, and because we prefer to minimize, in this case, we'll flip around this uh, division and say we want to minimize half the norm of W, such that the constraint holds. So that's our optimization objective. Um, Note that the objective itself doesn't actually use the data. So if we did this without the constraint, we could just let W go to zero and get a loss of zero. And the data is purely used in the constraints. So the constraints are very useful here, uh, very uh, important here. Um, this is called the hard margin classifier. It's called hard margin because we uh, have strictly enforced the constraint that nothing is allowed to be in the margins. So we have the support vector, and everything has to be on the other side of the support vector. Uh, sometimes that doesn't quite work out. Sometimes it's nice, if you have a bunch of outliers or a little noise, to allow some points to fall into the margin. Or if your uh, class is almost linearly separable, but not quite linearly separable, and you want some of them to be able to fall into the margins. Uh, what you can do then is use a soft margin SVM where you add a little slack parameter to the constraints. So what this says, we've added a value pi. For every uh, x, we add a learnable value pi. pi is uh, positive, so it can be 0 or bigger than 0. It cannot be negative. And basically what pi says is, if pi is 0, then we just recover the original constraint. Then for point i, we just require the point to be on the correct side of the margin. But we can also set pi a little bit higher, which allows uh, the point to violate the hard constraint. So then it doesn't have to be larger than 1 anymore. It has to be larger than 1 minus a little small value of pi. Uh, and to trade that off, to, to punish ourselves for uh, violating this constraint, we add pi, all the pi's we used, to the loss function. So we get another term multiplied by c, which is a hyperparameter. We have to choose c ourselves, which tells us how uh, 
how much we worry about violating these constraints. And then we, multi we, add the, uh, all the, we add up all the values of the PIs and we add that to our loss. So if you violate the constraint lots and lots of times, uh, lots and lots of points are allowed to go into the margin. And we can set W very low, very small. But we pay for that uh, violation of the constraints in, a, uh, in this term. This term becomes much bigger. So from the side, that looks like this. So here we have points that are not linearly separable. So if we were to, uh, so there's no way to do this with a hard margin classifier. But what we can do with a soft margin classifier is choose these points as support vectors and draw the uh, line that, uh, draw our classifier like this. And then these PIs become our penalty terms for having these two points inside the margin, having these two points on the wrong side of the support vectors. And what you see, even if it is linearly classify, uh, classifiable like here, uh, you might still prefer to use a soft margin classifier because as you see the soft, by discounting just these two points, the soft margin can massively increase its margin uh, versus a hard margin classifier. So even if you do this, so if you do this with a soft margin classifier, uh, even though it's linearly separable, the soft margin classifier might still choose to violate the constraints for these points because in return for these small violations, the margin becomes so much bigger, which is what we want to achieve. So at this point, there's a fork in the road. We now have the maximum margin classifier worked out. This is usable. We have a perfectly defined optimization objective. Uh, we can now do two things. One is to express everything in terms of W, as we've done before, in, and optimize for W, uh, which actually allows us to get rid of the constraints. We'll see how to do that. Uh, and then it's just a basic objective that we can use with gradient descent, like we've seen before, and uh, which also means that we can use it as the top layer of a neural network. That's sometimes called hinge loss as well. Uh, so that's very useful. But there's something else we can do, which brings us to this kernel trick. Let me mark off the support vector machines. Um, there's something else we can do, and that is express everything in terms of the constraints and get rid of W instead. So then we don't have, we don't end up with something that allows us to do gradient descent. It doesn't allow us to do back propagation. We can't really use the neural networks in a straightforward way. But we can apply the, the kernel trick, uh, which we'll look at in detail. But for now, just remember there's two ways of going from here. Either we get rid of W or we uh, get rid of the constraints. Uh, getting rid of the constraints is most straightforward, so let's start there. Uh, let me remember what I was supposed to say here. Oh yeah, so we reformulate the constraints. We look at what this PI value is. And we note that basically there are two options. If uh, the point I is a point that violates the constraint, then we know that the, uh, if we evaluate this, uh, this function here, we violate the constraint so it becomes lower than one. And then PI is the value that makes up the difference. So PI is one minus that value. So you see it here, if it's on the wrong side, if uh, the blue point is on the wrong side of the support vector, then PI is the value that makes up the difference between what the uh, classifier outputs, what the, the orange line gives us, and what it should be, which is one. And if P is on the right side, then it's zero, obviously. Then we don't pay a penalty. And we know that this value that we compute here becomes negative. Uh, but we know that PI cannot be negative, so 
pi becomes zero. So if we compute this value, we take this thing here. Uh, there's a slight mistake somewhere here. This is either this minus one or one minus this. Um, I'll fix that in the slides. But we take this value, this, this difference, and we don't allow it to become negative. That's the important part. So we take the max, uh, the max of this and zero. So if it's negative, we just set it to zero. And if it's not negative when the, we take this value, then that's an expression for what P is. Regardless of whether uh, the point is on the right or the wrong side, this is an expression of what P is. Which we can then fill into the loss function. So this is here after the capital sigma, that's where the uh, P used to be. We just filled in this max function and that gets rid of the constraint. So this is called hinge loss. And now we have a, an unconstrained optimization function which we can op uh, optimize using gradient descent. Which is quite interesting because you see here that this, uh, this thing that we ultimately looked for to optimize this margin decided the norm of W, uh, it doesn't look at the data. So you can think of this as functioning as a regularizer, it, uh, by which I mean that it stops the parameters, it stops the values of W from becoming too big. Because uh, the more, the bigger the values of W are, the more you pay in terms of your loss. And this value here that we've just worked out we can think of it as an error. It's what the plane outputs minus what the plane should output, uh, multiplied by this y so that we get the same value for positive and negative uh, points. So that's very similar to what we do with uh, least squares or uh, absolute error. We look at what the model outputs and we subtract what we want it to output, but we only look at that for the support vector. So only the points that are near the line count at all. The rest of the points we don't care about. And that's what this hinge loss, this max does for us. And then this C balances the regularizer with the absolute error. So that's the three loss functions we were going to discuss. We're now finished with that. We've discussed the least squares loss, the log loss, and the SVM loss. Uh, here's a little overview slide. So what you see here is Oh yeah, I've also included the accuracy, which remember is usually what we want to optimize, but it's not actually a good loss function. Um, these pictures we've all seen before. So here what you see is that in log loss, uh, the points near the decision boundary count a lot towards the loss and the points far away don't count at all. So you don't have this outlier effect that we had with the least squares loss. And the SVM is a sort of extreme version of that in that the uh, points near the decision boundary are the only points that matter. These points, once the decision boundary is chosen, the points that are far away from it have no influence at all on the value of the loss. So that's option one. <coughs> and that allows us to do uh, solve support vector machines with gradient descent. Option two. And I'm going to have to rush this. I apologize in advance. Option two is to get rid of W and PI instead of getting rid of the constraints. So for that, to do that, we need to figure out what it means to do constraint optimization. We cannot get rid of the constraints and do gradient descent. We have to work with the constraints. So here's a simple constraint optimization problem. Say we have a function that we want to optimize, fxwy, so we want to find the xy that minimize this red function such that the green function is true. Just to give you some visual intuition, what that means is we want to minimize this function, but xy, which is the sort of plane here, uh, we only allow some points in the xy plane. And in this case, these points are the points that lie on the unit circle. So we want the solution, we want out of the points on this unit circle in green here, we want to figure out which point minimizes the red function. So I can draw the domain, the unit circle. Above that lies this function. And what we want to find is the minimum point on this unit circle projected 
onto our surface. And the standard way of doing this, constraint optimization, is what's called Lagrange optimization. Uh, I won't try to give you intuition here. There'll be a little bit more explanation in the homework. But basically what you do is you take your constraint optimization problem, you rewrite your constraints as equality equals to zero. We'll, do, we'll just do uh, constraints expressed as equalities for now. Uh, you rewrite your constraint as something equal to zero. You multiply that value by a parameter alpha and you add it to your optimization function. Or uh, sorry, you subtract it to, from your optimization function. So if it's equality constraint, you can either add or subtract, it doesn't matter. Uh, so we make a new function L, which has the original parameters A, and a new parameter alpha, which is uh, multiplied by the constraint. And it turns out, oh, sorry, the point where this new function L, which is one dimension more because we've added a parameter, <clears throat> the point where that, uh, the gradient of this L function is equal to zero, that's your optimum under the constraint. So I don't have time to give you intuition, but just remember you set the constraint, you rewrite the constraint, you add it to the function, giving you a new function L. And if you optimize that function L by setting the constraint equal to zero, you find your optimum under the constraints. <clears throat> the drawback is you cannot easily solve that, find that point using gradient descent because that point is a saddle point. So here I've plotted the function L. Uh, and what you see is that the optimum where its gradient is equal to zero is a saddle point. So in one direction it's a minimum and in the other direction it's a maximum. So you cannot find this kind of point using gradient descent. Gradient descent just sort of bounces off and falls off in this direction. You need to solve it analytically. You need to optimize it properly for yourself. But if you do that, then you have the optimum, you found the optimum under the constraints. Uh, if your constraints are inequalities, it gets a little bit more tricky. Uh, so here we have a constraint optimization problem with inequality, with a bunch of inequalities. Uh, sorry, with a bunch of constraints, which are all inequalities. Uh, you do the same thing, you subtract uh, every constraint multiplied by its own alpha. So for every constraint, you add a parameter alpha to the function you add that to the optimization. And again, you solve it by setting the gradient to zero. But because we've used inequalities now, we also need to make sure that the alphas stay positive, the, uh, that they're bigger than zero. <coughs> uh, so we haven't actually gotten rid of the constraints. We've just swapped one constraint optimization problem for another constraint optimization problem, which doesn't sound like it buys you anything, but practically it's actually very useful to work out these kinds of dual problems as they're called. And if you do that for the SVM, it looks like this. So I won't do this now because there's no time and I'm pretty sure you're already full up with information. But if you do that with our constraint optimization problem and you work it all out, you end up with this new optimization problem. And if you go back to the 2018 lecture, you can actually see how this is done if you're really curious. But for now, you can just take my word for it. So we have a new bunch of parameters called alpha. These are these Lagrange uh, multipliers that we've introduced to work out the dual. And uh, we get a bunch of uh, new optimization, uh, new constraints, which state that the, uh, uh, the alphas have to be positive and lower than C. Uh, alpha times Y has to be zero. But most importantly, we see that in the objective function, we are no longer looking at W. W has disappeared. B has disappeared. And we are only looking at the dot products of every pair in the data. Of F for every I and J in the data, we only look at their dot products. Oh, the uh, question is, how do you get the value of C? C is a hyperparameter. So you pick it. You set it. Before you start, you set it to some value. It's, uh, uh, usually you increase in uh, orders of magnitude. So it's 0 0.1, 1, 10, 100, something like that. Uh, so if you take my word for it that this is now our optimization objective and you note that we're looking at all the dot products of the pairs of points in our data, 
we can now see what this kernel trick is about. Which states that if you have an algorithm which operates only on dot product of instances, you can replace that dot product with a kernel function. And that buys you a lot. So remember what we're trying to do is we're trying to do this, uh, this trick of increasing our feature space by adding features derived from the original features. We're trying to do that, but massively. So one thing we saw was that we uh, can get very far by including cross products. So for the original features x1 and x2, we add x1 times x2, x1 times x1, and x2 times x2. Those are called the cross products. And it turns out that you can do this adding cross products by, um, you can compute that very efficiently by taking the dot product of two uh, vectors and computing the square of their dot product. Uh, so I'll skip to the next slide. So imagine you have two two-dimensional vectors A and B, and you take their square, you fill in the dot product that just looks like this. Then you can work out this uh, square over a sum of two things, so hopefully you know that from high school, just the square of the first term times two times the product of both terms plus the square of the second term. Uh, what you can do then is rearrange this so that it looks like a different dot product. So what we do here is it's a sum. It's a sum of something from A times something from B. So we want that in the second term as well. So we break up this two into two things that multiply back together become two. So that's the square root of two. And we put all the A's, all the red stuff on the, uh, on the left and all the green stuff on the right. And here again, we have the red stuff on the left and the green stuff on the right. And this is another dot, a different dot product <coughs> of these vectors. So now we have these cross, uh, vectors of these cross products. And if we take their dot product, you will see, uh, oh, the, sorry, the square root of two is missing in the middle. But otherwise, you will see that you work out this dot product. It looks like this. So if you compute the dot product, uh, yeah, if you compute the dot product of these original vectors and you square it, you've essentially computed the dot product of these expanded vectors. And that's basically the kernel trick. So a kernel function is any function that computes the dot product over your vectors, but in a different feature space, without explicitly computing that feature space. Uh, so what we saw in this example is that we actually missed out the original features. So there's a simple trick, you just add plus one and then you get all the original features as well. And that's called a polynomial kernel. So you compute the dot product, you add plus one and you raise it to some power. If you raise it to the power of two, you get every two-way cross product. If you raise it to the power of three, you get every three-way cross product and so on. So as we saw that blows up combinatorially, so you get a massive feature space you're computing your kernels, your dot product, in a massive feature space. But you're not paying anything because this is almost as expensive as just computing the dot product. It doesn't cost anything extra to just raise it to power. Uh, and in return, you're getting loads and loads of features sort of for free. And because this formulation of the sport vector machine allows you to fit an optimal line using just the dot products, not knowing the actual feature values, knowing only the dot products, you can just substitute a kernel function like this polykernel and compute an optimal fit in a massively high dimensional feature space. Uh, here's another one called the RBF kernel, which is very popular. And for this one, it actually projects the features into an infinite dimensional feature space. The only way to think of this as explicit features is to think of infinite dimensional features, which gives you decision boundaries that are decidedly nonlinear like this. So on the left, we see the poly kernel. On the right, we see the RBF kernel. So note of warning here, the RBF kernel tends to overfit. Um, and all of this at the cost, same cost of fitting a linear classifier. Uh, I'll skip this slide. It's very easy. 
the theory may be a bit complex. Remember to normalize your data. It's very important once you start using kernels. But then you just, this is a code that allows you to do that in sklearn. So you might think, why, if they're so good, did neural networks come back? And that's because, uh, well, the main reason probably is that SVMs have quadratic training time. You need to know the dot product of every pair of instances in your data. So you need this big matrix over every instance in your data with every other instance in your data, which is n, uh, n to the power of 2. It's the size of that matrix, so that's a bit expensive. And neural networks just do this one pass over your data in stochastic gradient descent. <coughs> And then, of course, yeah, deep neural nets matured, hardware caught up with the theory, and machine learning culture, culture changed. Uh, well, I'll save you the details of that. Safe to say that neural networks did come back. They came back in a big way, and they caused kind of a revolution. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, next Monday when we start talking about deep learning. So thanks for your attention, and I'll see you next week.